The Central Kerbin Alliance Network's last mission to the mine was anything but routine. Armed communist drones have certainly made missions to the mine considerably more difficult. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. Since the communists have demonstrated no interest in the other moon of Kerbin, Minmus, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has decided to focus their efforts there. The Alliance intends to land three Kerbals on Minmus's surface, gather as much scientific data as possible, and bring home some green sandstone. The Mark 1-3 capsule is a proven design that has already safely returned Kerbals from the Mun surface. Due to the extremely low gravity on Minmus's surface, this craft can safely land on its engine bells. A single skipper engine does not have enough thrust, so a couple solid rocket boosters will be used to help with the initial part of the ascent. The scientific community has many unanswered questions about Minmus. Therefore, this craft will be packed with as many scientific instruments as possible. Hopefully, this mission will be able to solve the debate about the composition of Minmus's surface. The instruments being added right now are from the Breaking Ground DLC. Is Minmus really just a big scoop of mint ice cream, or is it made out of something else? Inquiring minds want to know. The veteran crew is comprised of Valentina, Bill, and Bob Kerman. The Kerbal Engineer readout indicates that Mint 1 is ready to go. All systems are go. Valentina, Bill, and Bob are ready for liftoff. All of Kerbal Kind awaits with bated breath for the first crewed mission to the surface of Minmus. Three, two, one, ignition. We have liftoff of Mint 1. Valentina reports that solid rocket booster number one is oscillating, yet Mission Control says not to worry about it. Everything will probably be fine. And so far, that assessment seems to be correct. After the solid rocket boosters are decoupled, the skipper engine continues to fire. It needs to get the craft up to almost orbital velocity with an apoapsis above 80 kilometers. As the craft continues to accelerate, the front of the rocket gets very hot, and it appears that one of the scientific instruments is damaged during ascent. Bob is reporting that it is the thermometer that was damaged. It was just a mercury-filled thermometer, so the crew will probably be fine. The rest of the mission will entirely rely on the Poodle engine. In addition to having a very high specific impulse, the Poodle engine, unlike the Terrier engine, also has an alternator and is able to generate electricity. After the ejection burn from Kerbin, the craft will still not have an encounter with Minmus's sphere of influence. This is because Mint 1 and Minmus have different orbital inclinations. However, Valentina will be able to make a mid-course correction and get her trajectory to intersect Minmus's sphere of influence. In this particular scenario, a small 40 meter per second burn in the normal direction is all it will take. With the inclination change now accounted for, Valentina begins plotting her next maneuver, a retrograde burn about 20 kilometers above the surface of Minmus. Throughout the flight, the Kerbals collect as much scientific data as possible. Bob even remembered to pack some EVA science experiments as well. Bob conducts all the experiments both in high space and low space over Minmus. All of the science from this mission should enable Kerbal Kind to advance their scientific understanding to the next tier. The entire concept of scientific points and tier levels is incomprehensible to most Kerbals. But to those working at the research and development facility, they say it all makes perfect sense. With the craft in a stable orbit, Bob conducts as much science as possible outside the craft, while Bill and Valentina look for a suitable landing site. One of those large flat areas will probably be best. As the craft passes over different biomes, Bob continues to report over everything he's seeing. Bill seems to be getting just a little bit annoyed with the whole process, saying something like, he gets that the moon looks mint green. This hasn't seemed to deter Bob though, as he continues his scientific experiments while on EVA. Valentina too hasn't seemed to be too annoyed with the whole process, as she continues to scan for a suitable landing site for the craft. Something that is on the light side and fairly flat would be ideal. It looks like Valentina has found her landing location. She begins prepping the craft for the landing procedure. A small retrograde burn puts the craft on a suborbital trajectory with the intended landing location right there on the flats. Bob continues to conduct as much science as possible even during the descent. The craft still has lots of delta V remaining, 
This should let the crew hop to a couple other locations and gather even more scientific data. And Valentina brings the craft down for a soft landing. Immediately upon touchdown, the crew starts running all of their different scientific experiments. A very excited Bob gets out of the craft and begins gathering all the data and conducting different EVA science experiments as well, such as the all-important golf ball test. Where did Bob get that six iron? Bob says that his friend Alan Kerman put him up to it. Now that does actually make sense, as Alan would probably do the same thing if given the opportunity. With the initial surface experiments complete, Bob re-enters the capsule and Bill and Valentina exit. Valentina then does the extremely important job of planting the Central Kerbin Alliance flag. Valentina's work on the surface is complete. Now Bill begins setting up the surface base. Being the engineer for the mission, he is tasked with deploying the solar panels. He also sets up the control station. This little science base lacks one thing, and that's any form of science experiments. So Bob once again gets out and deploys some mystery goo. A future mission then will be tasked with actually gathering the science from these deployed experiments. Bob still has one more task, and that is to gather some green sandstone. Fortunately, there happens to be a rock near the landing site. It's going to be really hard to convince the folks back home that these aren't mint-flavored sugar cookies. Having gathered the green sandstone, all of the primary objectives of the mission have been completed. And thanks to Valentina's excellent piloting, there is still plenty of Delta V left for this craft to hop over to a couple other biomes and gather a lot more science before this mission is ended. Just a few hundred meters away is the Lowlands biome. Upon landing in this new biome, the crew will then repeat all of the same science experiments that they conducted on the Greater Flats. During the short hop over, the crew reflects on just how nice Minmus is compared to the Mun right now, as there haven't been any commies shooting at them. And once again, Bob tests out his six iron on Minmus. What could be on the Mun that has the communists so possessive of that rock? So much so that they haven't even tried to land anything on Minmus. There is still plenty of Delta V for one more hop. If they launch the ship 90 degrees for just a little bit further, they will land in the Midlands biome. And yet again, it looks like Valentina has found a suitably flat location to land the ship. With her expert piloting, Valentina brings the ship in for another soft touchdown on the surface of Minmus, this time in a new biome where they will repeat all the same experiments again. The scientists back at Kerbin are very excited to get their suction cup fingers on all of this data. Many Kerbals will be very disappointed to learn that Minmus is not actually made out of mint ice cream. There may even be some kind of long-lasting conspiracy theory about how the missions were wrong and that the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is trying to hoard all of the mint ice cream for themselves, but it is hard to imagine anyone doubting the results of this very true Minmus landing. With their mission complete, Valentina plots a maneuver home. She sets up a pro-grade maneuver to exit Minmus's sphere of influence on the backside of its orbit. This single burn will bring the craft's periapsis inside of Kerbin's atmosphere. As Kerbin approaches, I would like to thank everyone for being a part of this channel. Just recently, the channel has reached 2,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey. It has literally taken thousands of you to get this channel where it is today. Thank you also for all of those likes and comments that you leave on these videos. Valentina now decouples the lower section of the craft in order to have the capsule re-enter the atmosphere. The craft's periapsis was just a little high so that it will now take two aerobraking passes in order for it to land. But this ends up working out very well for the crew, as now the landing point will be in the ocean far enough away from any communist-controlled territory. That could create quite the international incident if the crew were to land in communist-held territory. It is unclear if they would even release the crew back to the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. Well done, Val, Bill, and Bob. Another resoundingly successful mission. And with the recovery of the craft, the R&D is able to get their hands on all of the scientific information. All of this data has helped the Central Kerbin Alliance Network unlock a myriad of new technologies. Not the least of which is some improvements in fighter jet technology and an improved spy satellite. This new ScanSat technology 
will enable the Alliance to conduct a very high resolution scan of the planet and discover any anomalies. In the Vehicle Assembly Building, work begins in earnest on a new spy satellite. Spy satellite might not be the best term. The communists might not take that the best way. Perhaps something just like a global imaging orbiter. That sounds like a much better term for this satellite, as the communists will now think we're just looking at our houses from space. This camera does take quite a bit of power, so plenty of solar panels are needed to keep it running. A few struts are used to help keep the satellite stable in the fairing. With the upper stage completed, now work on the lower stage can begin. The upper stage has about 940 meters per second of delta V, so the lower stage will need at least 3000 meters per second to get the craft into a proper polar orbit. With the high res satellite and booster complete, it is time to take the rocket out to the launch pad. This should help the Alliance get a better picture of communist activity on the planet. The rocket is launched north and just a little bit to the west to cancel out Kerbin's rotational velocity. The booster stage powers the craft through the lower atmosphere. The lower stage is able to accelerate the craft up to around 1700 meters per second and achieve an apoapsis around 80 kilometers. In the upper atmosphere, the fairings are jettisoned and the upper stage fires. As the satellite passes the Kármán line, the solar panels are deployed. And at the craft's apoapsis, the engines will exhaust their fuel, putting the craft into a stable orbit. The craft's final orbit will be just a little lower than engineers had hoped, but it will be sufficient. As the satellite passes over the North Pole, engineers activate its camera. And almost immediately, the craft starts to pick up some unusual activity. It appears the communists have something going on near the North Pole. Using an old KB-47, Johnny and Cassidy Kerbin are headed north to see if they can get a better look at what the communists are up to. They have been ordered not to provoke the communists and to remain in international airspace. While not as fast and agile as the Alliance's new K-101s, the craft is able to defend itself with a rear-mounted turret. As Johnny and Cassidy reach the polar ice shelves, they are immediately engaged by two new style of communist MiGs. These new MiGs are faster and more heavily armed than the old MiG-15s. Cassidy attempts to radio the MiGs to remind them that they are in international airspace. Johnny banks the craft left and right so that the remote turret can line up with the enemy. What is near the North Pole that the communists would keep a couple MiGs around to defend it? Johnny is working very hard to avoid the communist cannon fire. Although an older design, Johnny is certainly making the best use of what he has. How long will Johnny and Cassidy be able to keep this up? They are outnumbered, outgunned, and the nearest help is hundreds of kilometers away. But the remote turret is still working. As long as Johnny's got ammo and keeps her flying, maybe he has a chance. Or maybe I spoke too soon. They just went down into the ocean. The intelligence network of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network reports that these are the new communist MiG-19s. They are armed with three 23mm cannons and can fly much faster and higher than the old MiG-15s. That's quite the debris field. Perhaps when the Alliance gets a satellite overhead, it can point its antenna towards them and see if it picks up a signal. This is Echo 3. And they're alive.